Good morning, everyone. Um, so here we are at the start of the year and with, with, with a forecast and an outlook um, that in, in some ways is perhaps positive given where we came from in the last two quarters uh, of last year. But it's certainly not something to shout about, particularly in terms of the positivity of the outlook pushing right out into 2025. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. So what we'll see is, is we'll see um, rather sort of up, unexciting changes in, in terms of the core metrics of outputs and orders, but some silver linings in areas of uh, uh, labor, so employment growth uh, and investment intentions, with the overall theme being that the sector seems to be robustly confident about its prospects, despite metrics, uh, those core metrics of output and orders and so on, for the past uh, three to four quarters, uh, not giving us as analysts much sign for why there is so much confidence built into, uh, built into the sector's sentiment. Um, we had a bit of a blip, uh, as we see in the first bullet point there, a bit of a blip last quarter uh, in terms of output. Uh, given that the orders and demand wasn't there to support it, we, we we expected it to be a blip in the data. And indeed, it does seem to have transpired to, to, to be as such. Um, in terms of uh, significant changes this quarter, and I said something we're keeping an eye on and something we've, we've been very interested in, perhaps really since the recovery, since the COVID recovery period, is the sector's price setting behavior. So that's where how the sector is um, changing its prices quarter on quarter. And we've seen that coming down for quite some time, naturally in keeping with the elevated uh, base rate environment, uh, driving down inflation. We've seen that too on the supply side pricing behavior. But just now we've seen that turn a corner a little bit and we see the price rising behavior accelerate somewhat. But also what might explain some of that away is that we're seeing margins drop uh, a little, those having also been slowly recovering um, or becoming less bad, I should say, uh, over the past few quarters as well. We see a small uptick in labor, and despite being small, a small uptick in investment intentions over the next 12 months, why this is important, even though it is a small uptick, is that general, the, the other metrics would indicate that uh, investment intentions or capital expenditure confidence would be, would be going down in this kind of environment, especially where our growth forecasts, as we'll get to in a, in, in a moment, uh, are not very exciting uh, right the way out into 2025, uh, which paints quite a flat C, for lack of a better word, uh, for the coming year and into the into the following year. But confidence, um, as I mentioned earlier, remains quite robust, and it's remained robust really over the past two years, um, despite various yo-yoing and metrics and changes in uh, what we think of the analyst sentiment, um, the sector's reported confidence, both in their own businesses and in the wider UK economy, has remained impressively um, resilient uh, to those short-term changes in mood. So we can see here at the bottom the current uh, latest forecast for Q1. So that's UK GDP at, at a modest 0.6 for 2024 and going up to 1.6 for 2025. But what we're really interested in, manuf interested in manufacturing GBA is 2024 at 0.1, so roundly flat, and then 2025, 0.8, again, in that in that 10th uh, uh, decimal point figures there. So both quite flat forecasts for the year ahead. What we'll do now is we'll, we'll go and uh, interrogate some of those some of those metrics uh, with some illustrations, so it'll give some color to what I'm saying. So if we could have the next slide, please. We'll start off by looking at uh, output and orders, and we'll see here that uh, output, these are balance of change figures, as I always remind people. So these don't <clears throat> represent the absolute change uh, in terms of the degree of output quarter on quarter. They represent the proportion of the sector uh, that is reported on balance and increase in output and orders and, and vice versa. So we have here the red bars, red box bars are output and the orange bars are orders. And as I was alluding to it, that, that, that entry, you can see under the far right at 2023 Q4, just the penultimate grouping of bars, you'll be able to see that there was a little blip in output there uh, coming from 23 Q3, where we had a pretty much flat balance of change for both output and orders. And here we are in 22, uh, 2024 Q1, just on the far right there. Um, you'll see that a small improvement from 23 Q3, but still quite low. And indeed, just visually, you can see compared to this time series from 2018, ignoring the the, the obvious uh, gouges in, during COVID, um, we can see there's quite quite a, a low balance of change for the growth of output and orders there. Can I have the next slide, please? And now looking at uh, the breakdown of that orders, uh, orders equation. So that's UK and export orders. Um, we look at this often to see if there's something going on between the demand conditions domestically and the demand commission conditions abroad. And now when I say demand conditions abroad, given that something uh, near enough 60, just over 60% of uh, of all uh, UK manufactured trade uh, is with the European Union or, or member states within the European Union. Um, 
it can proxy the export orders as demand from the EU there as well, as that's the controlling factor of that of that trade. Now, we see here on the far right, ignoring the green box bar for a minute, which I'll get to for a moment, that both the balance between UK orders and export orders is equal, despite the total order level being somewhat flat. It's the balance we're interested in there. So we can see in, in the 2023 Q4, so just third grouping of bars from the left, you can see that actually export orders had a enjoyed a strong a stronger bit of demand uh, than the UK orders, where you can't actually see UK orders because they were a perfect, perfect flat reported figure. Now, talking about that green box bar, and we'll see a few of these. Whenever you see a green box bar, this is the sector's future intention, uh, what it expects a given metric uh, to perform at or report at uh, in three months' time. So in this case, that would be uh, the Q2 figures. Uh, we haven't adjusted uh, those at all. That is the, the sector's aggregate sentiment. Um, and so you can see here, and what we'll notice a few times, is that there is a degree of positivity there, uh, that next quarter those demand conditions effectively is what we're looking at here, is those demand conditions are going to improve. Now, this has happened for a few quarters in a row where we've we've seen the expectation has been uh, demand conditions or what, be it demand, be it output, be it whatever, uh, are going to improve next quarter. And that's the, the opinion of the sector. And it hasn't quite come to pass for quite a few quarters in a row. So, so, of course, despite this missing the mark, and we'll see in a slide that we'll, we'll, we'll marry up those expectations versus reality. But what this has started to give us a sense of is the sector combined with that ongoing confidence uh, seems to hold that around the corner anytime soon, effectively any quarter now, uh, there is going to be a break in the or going to be a release in the breaks of what's keeping uh, the sector's uh, output growth down. Uh, and it'll move back to that more steady growth footing. At least this is what the data su would suggest from, from the sector. Can I have the next slide, please? So as, as I mentioned, this slide is effectively marrying up those expectations and then what actually came to pass. So I know it looks like a lot in, in the first, but I'll, I'll explain it thoroughly, don't worry. So uh, again, as usual, if we start by looking at the right, you'll notice we have columns with two flavors of box bars and then two flavors of dot. The bars represent, the darker bar represents the forecasted from the sector. So the sector's expectation for output and orders respectively on the bars. And the dots represent what actually came to pass when we then look back at that quarter. So if we look at the far right, for example, where it says 2024 Q1, the bars represent those expectations was, that were set at the end of last year by the sector. So where the sector thought output and orders were going to come in in terms of balance figures, the dots are what have actually come to pass. So what that illustrates there is that a little bit of over optimism um, in terms of where out the balance figures for output and orders were going to come in this quarter at the end of last quarter. Uh, not terribly so. And if it's particularly if we look at uh, if you cast your eye down to 2023 Q3, so that's three groupings away from the right. You can see that expectations were gargantuan uh, compared to what actually came to pass in that quarter and then in the quarter before that just for for for, for reference we see 23q2 you can see that actually expectations were pretty much bang on the mark and you see these things can vary and of course if we look at the around the center of this whole chart at around the 2020 area you can see that when certain strong crises hit obviously such as covid uh, we can see that expectations in reality couldn't be further uh, further apart and so we have this here because effectively we find that when when the sector can effectively predict um it's three monthly balance figure with, within, you know, within close enough of a mark. What this tells us uh, as economists is it shows us there's a degree of predictability within a business predictability within that business environment that UK manufacturers are operating within. When the mark's starting to get missed, it's not so much uh, pointing a finger and suggesting the sector can't predict what's around the corner. What it tells us is that it shows us that it's an unpredictable business environment. Um, and so it quite quite a useful tool this to, to see where the sector is and where the sector is in terms of the UK uh, UK business environment. Go have the next slide, please. So I, I made a I made a, a point about this at the start. This is represents our prices and our margins. Now, uh, the, the, particularly with prices, we can compare this with ONS data, but margins data is proprietary to this um, research. Um, so the red bars uh, represent the UK and export price setting behavior of the sector. And it's important to say the price setting behavior because it indicates to what degrees, what balance of the sector is either increasing or decreasing their UK and export prices respectively quarter on quarter. The lines beneath represent a UK margins and export margins with the darker bar being export margins and UK margins being the lighter blue bar. Now you can see here, um, excuse me, uh, you can see here on the right that actually we've been coming down from about 22 Q4. Those those uh, colored bars have been coming slowly down. And this is to be expected, of course, because this is when those elevated interest rates, that central rate behavior started to bite into the sector, not just here in the UK, but also right across um, Europe and other places as well. And what we saw is that that 
that changed the degree of price setting behavior, uh, bringing that down. Indeed, it was almost exactly the goal of central banks to, to do just that. Now here, if we look just to the left of the green box bar, you can see actually that the, the red and orange bars have just come above uh, compared to where they were at 2333. Not massively so, but an interesting observation that actually it's been on a steady downward trajectory for over a year now. And now we're seeing a slight tick up in those price, that price setting behavior. Interesting to contrast with as well as we look at that penultimate grouping. So just to the left again of that, that green box bar, we see the two lines for margins. We see at this same time, while price setting behavior has increased, we actually see that margins have declined. So what we're likely seeing here in the short term is uh, costs are in, since the start of the year, effectively, uh, costs, uh, selection of costs of exceeding uh, the, the sector's profitability, drawing those margins down. And as a response to that, we're seeing the sector on aggregate uh, start to uh, increase its prices somewhat, even in and amongst uh, this elevated interest rate environment. Now, we would have expected to see this price setting behavior return to growth um, in terms of the rate at which those prices are being raised once we start seeing central banks drop those central uh, bank rates in earnest. Um, but this is effectively, we see this jumping the gun uh, in response to those margins becoming uh, under erosion a little there. In terms of the green box bar, that's that's what the sector expects next quarter. It expects, you know, for argument's sake, pretty much the same uh, degree and rate of price setting behavior increases next quarter. Go to the next slide, please. So confidence, and as I mentioned, and you'll see on the right here, those lines are almost perpendicular if you if you were to pull out a ruler. So um, what I should also mention is this is a diffusion index. So that's a, that's a fancy word for effectively, if you look at the left, if it's above five, it indicates positivity. And if it's below five, it indicates negativity. So you can see quite clearly on the right, really for the past uh, year, uh, just over the past year, um, confidence for both business performance and the sector's view on UK economic conditions has been robustly and consistently positive. Um, and with business performance, this represents the aggregate factor of what manufacturers feel about their own business. And then UK economic conditions is how the sector feels about the wider UK economy. It's typical for them to trail each other as such. Um, and we see actually in the, in the latest data, so that's 24Q1, I mean, ever so slightly, it's tipped up a little bit, but I won't, I won't go zooming in like that. But what we can see is when we contrast this, if we if you harken back to what you saw in the first selection of slides, those core core metrics of output and orders, you can see they've been you know all over the place in comparison to this. We've had a particularly uh, good uh, good uh, posted figures on output and orders, quite bad ones, so on and so forth. But confidence remains robust throughout it all. So what this tell, shows to us is that first of all, we do know the sector is resilient, but second of all, it shows that these short term movements uh, in the sector's prospects don't seem to be worrying the sector itself. Otherwise, we'd expect more volatility in the confidence metric, as we have seen if we blast back uh, throughout the time series here, just visually looking at the confidence metric, we can see that it is susceptible to changes in sentiment. But whatever's happened in the past year and a half hasn't been significant enough to shift the dial in the sector's uh, sentiment about its own prospects. And it's an interesting point to take away. Come to the next slide, please. And this is the final metric. This is employment and investment. So. Um, interesting here, because I mentioned these are the two areas where we're seeing slight um, upticks, uh, slight, certainly, um, but welcome in, in, in a period of rather rather uh, sort of placid forecast going forwards um, for the next year or so. Now, the red bars represent that uh, employment in terms of balanced figures of whether the sector or whether given businesses in aggregate have increased their employment or decreased them. And then investment intentions, that is that orange line represents the future 12 month um, investment intention. So not just quarterly, it's a rolling 12 month uh, average about what the sector expects to invest or a sentiment towards investment. So we see just to the left of the green box bar, we see compared to the uh, end of last year, the employment, the balance figures for employment has come up a little, not quite where it, where we can see where a typical growth figure is around when we cast our eyes back over the chart, uh, but good nonetheless, especially given the context that we're in. Um, again, also with investment intentions, we see that tick up, and this is particularly uh, positive because all signs point towards uh, capital expenditure intentions sort of declining, especially given this... Um, uh, this poor forecast for the for the year ahead, combined with the expensive capital environment, um, we wouldn't expect to see it start growing yet. So that, that's a good sign uh, for the sector sentiment around investment. Now, a quick sidebar around um, vacancies, as we like to often talk about, those are coming down a little in the sector. They've been up for a very, very long time. Uh, ever since COVID, they haven't really recovered in terms of there's been a new normal in the amount of demand there's been for labour within the sector. It's always been a long-standing issue, but it's been particularly acute since the end of COVID. 
Um, so we use a ratio often to describe that. And now the long term average for, for the number of vacancies in the sector per 100 employed is two before 2020. So that's two vacant uh, jobs in the UK's manufacturing sector, vacant for every 100 employed. Now, since uh, since the, the, the COVID recovery, that peaked at around four. So effectively, the demand for labor or the vacancy rate was twice as hot as it, as it had been in that long run 20 year average. It's coming down now. It's, it, it has been steadily trickling from 3.13, 2.7 to now being at 2.7. It's been going down a, a decimal point each time. Um, so it's still higher than that long run average, but now only by 0.7. So what we can see is the demand for labor for cooling and or um, those vacancies are slowly being filled as when we combine it with our employment data, because we can see employment growth has spent very little time below the zero line apart from during that, that, that critical period during COVID. It's an interesting point there. Come to the next slide, please. This is a visualization of what we saw in the very first slide, a visualization of, of those forecasts uh, going ahead. Now, the bars have been scaled, so it seems like they're quite large, but don't be fooled. As you can see, if you look at uh, particularly the red bars, uh, those are 0.1 and 0.8. Uh, the figures we're interested in, particularly interested in there for, for the manufacturing forecast for the year and the next year ahead. Particularly with 2025, I must caveat that, you know, it is subject to change. That is that the forecast is almost ceteris paribus from this position. Um, there's plenty of space uh, for significant improvement. There's, I wouldn't say there's that much space for much downside on that forecast, but there's significant space for upside, uh, particularly when we start to see some serious um, easing from central banks, uh, importantly, not just from the UK, but from, from Europe as well. Uh, if that happens earlier than expected, activity will likely bounce back a little earlier than expected. And it's our, our, our secret understanding, I should say, because we're not officially built into the forecast, uh, that there's some pent up demand uh, in the sector uh, that has been suppressed by this extended period of heightened, heightened central rates. So can I have the next slide, please? And this slide is exactly the same as the first slide. I know I've gone over a lot here and it's a, it's a, it's a, lot, a lot to take in. So I'll just leave you, I think, with two, uh, two major points um, to think about which is, first of all, uh, an interesting, it's a tidbit, but it's an interesting one, that we're seeing our price setting behavior metric actually increase, even despite in this in this heightened inflation rate environment, uh, because margins are falling a little. Uh, and that's something to keep a keen eye on. And we'll be looking at that next quarter as well to see if actually the sector is going to subvert the wider economy within terms of uh, sort of effectively ignoring that central rate effect and, and upping its prices nonetheless. And the second important point is, as we've detailed at length, is that confidence, particularly with confidence from where we see that grid, those green box bars, the sector doesn't seem to be, for lack of a better word, as worried as we might be as economists when we look at these changes, short term changes, changes in metrics, uh, because the confidence would reveal uh, a sector that is nervous about its upcoming or past quarters performance, despite those metric figures not being particularly positive. So that that indicates resilience and quite a lot of uh, hope for the sector in the year ahead, despite um, some rather flat forecasts. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. I think um, our uh, our release that came out yesterday used the word sort of anemic as part of that. Um, I mean, if you look at those, uh, the outlook results for Q1, it's kind of showing a relatively a flat trend, um, effectively. Um, and I guess, I guess the question then is, how do you, as a business, make sure that you can um, grow effectively and outstrip the market in those uh, in that sort of environment? But uh, thanks for it very much, for that, James. I'm sure we'll come back. There'll, there'll be some questions at the end, and uh, uh, if you can join the Q and A, that would be fantastic. Um, just just a few other observations on that before we. Um, before we move to the panel conversation. I think one of the things is that, um, sort of building what James was saying there, is that, you know, as an industry, you know, the forecasts are looking pretty flat, but in terms of the level of confidence that manufacturers themselves have in what they're doing, it's still pretty strong. It's a resilient sector. Um, the businesses that we work with you know, have uh, gone through quite a lot of upheaval, as has the broader economy over the last few years, and are still there, still going and still um, still investing and innovating. Um, and we'll pick up on those points uh, within the panel discussion in a second. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, there's there's still a lot of complexity around in terms of uh, international trade for manufacturers. Um, the other side of it is, which James picked up on, was um, 
that whole skills and talent piece as well. It seems to be easing somewhat, but that's been a long term uh, and uh, sort of, uh, yeah, it's been running for a long period of time in terms of that ability to retain skills within the industry, make sure that we have the right talent, um, et cetera. Um, the other point I think we'll probably pick up on as well is um, the broader area of supply chains, um, the ability to export, the ability to have access to um, uh, materials as well to actually manufacture um, continues to be a bit of a challenge. And also there are broader um, drivers uh, macroeconomically as well, um, uh, as well as technology changes around the digital revolution, things people and manufacturers need to think about now to be able to take advantage of that and grow effectively in the future. I think the other point is that we will we'll also come on to is the role that government plays in driving and supporting that investment culture uh, for manufacturers. And, and we'll pick up on, on each one of those points as we go through the panel. And um, just moving to our um, panel uh, members, um, just to sort of reiterate, we have um, Simon Bird, who's a partner in, and heads up our manufacturing tax capability within BDO. Um, we've got Seamus, who joins us and has uh, been on a couple of our other panels previously, who's the chief economist at Make UK. And we have uh, James Moore as well, who's the manufacturing, uh, sorry, the uh, managing director of Hosokawa Micron Limited up in, up in the northwest of England. So welcome to all three of you. Um, if I um, kick things off, Simon, probably um, you're probably the person to kick things off effectively. Uh, but clearly there's been, you know, the autumn statement in terms of uh, budget, etc. We've had an update of that in the last couple of weeks, which hasn't been particularly um, overly exciting compared to uh, to the autumn statement. Um, but it'd be useful to get your views on, um, you know, the, the key announcements that were relevant for manufacturers, um, whether beneficial or non-beneficial. Um, the most relevant things that uh, are worth thinking about from a, a manufacturer's perspective when it comes to uh, the tax environment. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, I think I think start really with um, probably what will be a consistent theme across the board in terms of really looking for a long term strategy to support the sector. And whilst there's lots of aspects and bits that fall into that, in my area, I do think tax can play a really key part having that environment that's got um, certainty for manufacturers so they can factor it into their various investment decisions is really important and it's something that we've been looking at and calling for 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 quite a while and so if i think back to the autumn statement it was quite nice to see some uh, real focus on the sector and announcements around supporting it within that um within that statement i think on a capital expenditure side we've seen things over the last sort of year or so with making the annual investment allowance permanent we moved to a full expensing uh, for capital investment and an announcement in the autumn statement saying that that was going to be made permanent as well which i think is really important for supporting the sector and as i say factoring those those tax incentives into um, various different investment regimes on that capital side the issue about full expensing is still slightly um, uh, unsatisfactory, I suppose, in the sense that certain leased assets can't fall within the, the scope of the regime. Um, there was a, a nice statement from the Chancellor that he is aware of that and is looking to change it, which is very pleasing. But the caveat of when fiscal conditions allow with no sort of indication of when that might be um, doesn't, uh, doesn't give any sort of certainty to manufacturers as to when that, that might come. But hopefully, um, over the course of the next few statements, we might see that, which will be a welcome, welcome change. Um, I guess the other one that's a change that we've seen from a manufacturing perspective is all around R&D. Um, we've got a merging of the regimes um, coming in from April this year, which I think will simplify uh, things for a number of manufacturers, lead to a lot more consistency in terms of R&D claims. Uh, rates of which R&D is allowed, is uh, um, benefit is achieved is going up albeit offset slightly by um, by increase in tax rates. But overall, I see that as a really positive change from a, from a manufacturing perspective and continue to incentivise um, businesses to invest in the UK uh, and, and support through that R&D regime. Thanks, Simon. Just on, just on that, the other thing that obviously we're hearing is that the level of focus going on to R&D tax credits has increased quite significantly. Um, over the last kind of six months or so. I mean, it would be good to get your 
observations on that as well in terms of um, people's um, level of confidence in what they may have already put through to the tax man or what they may be planning to do in the future. Um, yeah. Good to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, we have seen HMRC invest a lot in inspectors and more focus on R&D claims and challenging those, uh, making sure that the costs are falling within scope and that the projects for which R&D has been claimed are truly um, uh, innovative. Um, we've also seen a change in terms of what needs to be submitted. So um, the AIF form um, needing a lot more detail to support the claims, which I think is all in that um, that area of the revenue trying to increase investment by making the regime simpler and more attractive, but also clamping down and making sure that actually the claims that go in through that regime are, are robust. And I think our point from a, we see a lot of manufacturers do um, support their claims, certainly from our R&D team, and they, they have a, a strong record in terms of supporting those claims and the analysis they do. Um, so it, it's just making sure that you do have that robust evidence to support the claims that are going to be put into uh, the tax authorities because the likelihood of them being challenged is probably increased over the course of the last year or so. Yeah, it, do, it does feel like that that sort of regime has um, there's been quite a bit of, bit more focus where there may have been a relatively yeah. light touch um, in the past. Thanks, Simon. We'll come. We'll come back to you just on some, some of the broader um, uh, conversations a little bit. Um, Seamus, if I can come to you, um, clearly, you know, for manufacturing, things don't change overnight. Well, COVID kind of changed things overnight, but in the in the broader context, in terms of planning, making sure that um, uh, you can actually put a business plan together that works for your business, both in the sort of medium and long term. Um, clearly having a level of stability around that and certainty around the environment in which you're planning to build your business is absolutely critical. I mean, from your, from your perspective, if we look at kind of, if we take the kind of longer term view of that um, and some of the initiatives that, you know, potentially could be put in place and policies that could be put in place for manufacturers, um, be useful to get your kind of handle on things of where we're at and what you're hearing that Make UK uh, members are really looking for and are keen to see um, from a policy perspective. Well, you're absolutely right about sort of the importance of, of stability and policy. Obviously, COVID was an example of how things can be turned on their head quite dramatically. And when, when that does happen, it's very disruptive. Um, if you just take the last 15 years as a sample, um, there have been 15 different ministers or secretaries of state responsible for what we would broadly define as industrial strategy in the UK. The department responsible has been restructured five times. There have been six different growth or industrial strategies in that time. Um, to take another example, corporation tax, there have been 26 changes to it since 2019. Yet the average investment cycle for a manufacturing firm is about seven years. So it takes seven years from the inception of an idea and, and consideration and exploring of that as an investment opportunity until full implementation and realization. So we need to see long-term stability in, in policy making and forward guidance from government and from the treasury around what it is they will be prioritizing, what the tax regime and the incentives are going to be uh, to encourage firms to invest and to enable them to invest. And, uh, and that's really, really important. And it's something we're seeing across the board in other countries, the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, the Green New Deal in the EU are leading the way on this. And right now, the UK is really the only major industrial economy that doesn't have a, a stable long term industrial strategy plan. Now, that is changing, of course, and we saw with the announcement on full expensing in particular in the autumn statement and the follow on. Uh, in the spring statement that the commitment to look at at leasing, as Simon mentioned, there will be a consultation, we understand, launched on that uh, sooner rather than later, perhaps in the next couple of months. Um, and that's a really clear indication for go from government that they need to set the right type of incentives. But what we have also seen from the Chancellor, uh, Jeremy Hunt, is a recognition and an understanding of the real term conditions that business face uh, and that they need to know in the longer term, in the medium to longer term, that the envi policy environment is likely to be stable. And when we look ahead to this year being a, a, an election year, a likely election year, 
the polls suggest it might be a Labour government and they, the, the Labour Party, when we speak to them, also have, have got that message. So I think there is a, a growing consensus across the political spectrum and an understanding that the constant chop and, and turn and change that we've seen in recent times really hasn't encouraged or enabled the kinds of investment that we need for transition to net zero, for the likely digitization and automation of the industry that's going on. And there is an increasing focus on advanced and advancing manufacturing and that productivity question, which has been such a big challenge from an economics perspective for a long time. And what we've seen from the, the, the report that we, we launched yesterday, um, and as James mentioned earlier, is that despite um, a, a fairly stagnant economic picture, there is a clear appetite to invest. And lots of companies recognize that they need to invest to stay ahead and are very keen to do so. So thankfully, there is a growing consensus um, um, around uh, re recognizing that stability uh, and forward guidance is going to be fundamental to enabling that to happen. Yeah, thanks, James. I, was, it, I think um, one of my observations, obviously, was the um, Make UK Manufacturing Conference uh, a month or so ago, uh, and it, it does feel like across the political spectrum, there's a broader recognition that um, proper structured and longer term thinking needs to be put in place to support to support the industry. So it's um, that whole industrial strategy uh, thing has been obviously um, the drumbeat of uh, Make UK for quite a few years now to try and make sure that that is embedded. It feels like there there's a, there's a greater uh, recognition of a requirement for that uh, across across the political spectrum at the moment. So thanks thanks for that, James. Um, so we've had we've had the uh, the tax partners view of the world, uh, we've had the economists and the Make UK view of the world. Um, now we're going to get into the real world, which is uh, an actual manufacturer. So we've got James Moore uh, joining us. Um, James, it would be really good to get you know your kind of views of what's really affecting you as a business right now. What's constraining you from? growing faster what you know is that exports is it supply chain is it talent um it'd be good to get a view on that and also um just uh, if you could give us just a little bit of background about what hosokawa micron does etc would be kind of really good context to sort of kick that off yeah certainly uh first of all thank you very much for the invite to participate in the discussion today um yeah we are part of the hosokawa micron corporation so we're the uk operating unit within the uh, global corporate entity that's based in Osaka in Japan. Uh, we design, deliver and support industrial equipment, specifically powder processing systems and equipment therein and containment solutions from that. Um, all of the conversations at this point is basically they're all sort of itches we've got to scratch, I think, in terms of the need for long term planning, the need for a long term view on things. We've got to get away from the short term as we do. Um, capital equipment as well that, that we provide to customers. So having a short-term focus doesn't work for us, doesn't work for our customers either. Um, we Our business is split roughly a third, a third, a third from UK, EU, rest of world. So all of the bureaucratic and import and export challenges as well that have manifested in the last few years, they hit us hard. And we, we have to allocate resource to managing that situation and looking to drive efficiency wherever we can. Um, we also suffer from the skills gap, so we need to see investment in plugging that skills gap. We've got certain positions within our business that we've we've been struggling to fill for quite a while now. Um, you know, the, the employment market has changed significantly, and whether it be not just on the cost, a lot of it is just availability of the right uh, the right workers with the right qualifications that we can fit into the business as well. So, you know, we're also looking for that support in terms of boosting innovation and R and D as well. So you know, whether that being digitalization, whether it being automation, whether it being sustainability as well, um, everything is a challenge for us. And I think we've got those headwinds coming in from different directions now, where it used to be far more predictable. We just uh, we've touched on COVID a few times here. That just came from nowhere, obviously, and, and that brought about um the, the sort of you know James in his initial um, presentation of the the report mentioned a couple of key adjectives like resilience and robustness, and I think that that really baked that into our business because we had to change very radically, very very quickly. So 
as uh, challenging as the, the whole pandemic situation was, I think that we as a business have come out of that with that uh, far more resilient, far more robust approach as well and anticipating that things could change radically very quickly as well. So, you know, it's that blending of that short-term issue, but really trying to get that focus on the long-term outlook for the business as a whole. Yeah. Thanks, James. It's, um, it's uh, yeah, lots of um, different factors hitting you all at one time, but I, I yeah. think you're absolutely right. I think over the last few years, everyone's just got used to that. It, it is, the, to hate, I hate to use the words, but the new normal. Yeah, of, uh, actually dealing with multiple things, um, lots more plates to spin um, and lots more la- levers to keep an eye on as well in terms of, well, if this happens, then what, what do we do next? So in terms of planning cycle, you know, one of the key things is making sure that there's, you know, those things will happen, right? You can't control them, but but there are certain elements within the country that you can at least uh, stabilise and that, that that's where the role of government and the tax environment kind of comes into that as well. It does, and it has to match up, Richard, because, you know, with, yeah. with, you know, our typical planning cycles are 12 and 36-month periods, but now within Hoscar in the UK, we're looking at stretching it out to 2030. So it's two of the midterm cycles we'd normally have, so that we're building in that long-termism in everything we do as well. So we want to know that, that competitive environment in which we operate is aligned with that as well, so that that long termism we've mentioned a few times is absolutely vital to us. So we can we can build a plan um, during which we know there's going to be a heck of a lot more change, whether that be in the sustainability elements, the digital elements, the technology, the even the workforce as well. That we've got a bit more and a bit more, hopefully a lot more confidence that we can execute that plan. Yeah, yeah. So th- thanks for that, James. I'm just um, just thinking about. Um, broader sort of government initiatives that are going on at the moment. Um, Simon, do you want to start to share with us um, some of the things that are going on around Made Smarter? Because obviously that's been one government initiative that's been expanded to from sort of a regional to a national basis. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess that just demonstrates again the investment the government's making, isn't it, in terms of looking to support businesses with innovation and technology and how they can particularly in the manufacturing sector, really um, use that to drive productivity increases and growth within the sector. Um, I think when we look back to um, the autumn statement, I think the number was around 4.5 billion in terms of the amount of investment that the government was going to make into various different subsectors across the uh, manufacturing sector. So I think that's a really good and positive message from um, from government in terms of the support it's going to uh, going to provide, and the more we can get that channel through to businesses, support them with uh, implementing those digital technologies and things that are going to really drive productivity, the the better for the sector. Yeah, I mean, J- James, on that, um, in terms of digitization within your business, I mean, is that a major driver for you right now, or is it one of those things that you you're kind of looking at but potentially not? not pushing particularly hard it'd be good to get your it it is and i think when when we initially set out on it we had all these um grand ambitions that we would digitally transform everything every facet of the business but then the reality of uh, resource constraints the right partners to work with and all of these other issues as well bit so we had to scale back that original ambition to make it something that we could uh, we could roll out so we're making progress but we're possibly not quite as transformatively or rapidly as we hoped for initially so we're constantly looking at well whether it's a priority that's in the now category the next or the later so making sure we are transforming the business we're changing the business but we're not disrupting it too much as well simultaneously so i think the initial ambition um yeah was to kind of do everything all at once but we've had to scale that back slightly for all the reasons i said like resource constraints being a primary one yeah the other thing that um we're having a quite a lot of discussion with um, manufacturing clients at the moment from a BDO perspective is, is the whole um, transition to sort of net, net zero and um, sustainability. And I'm going to throw this one out to throw this one out to everyone. Um, but, but one of the things that conversations that we've been having is that there's a, clearly there are things that um, businesses that can do that will um, improve profitability and drive towards that net zero agenda at the same time and those kind of things are kind of no-brainer activities that you kind of do as part of what you would hope would be um 
business as usual to improve the performance of your business. Uh, then there are other things where, um, you know, in manufacturing in particular, where energy is, you know, and, and consumption is, it's, it can be quite considerable. It's thinking about how do you move towards some of those projects, which may well require investment to actually deliver both um, a, a, a lower carbon footprint, but also potentially improve uh, profitability at the same time. Then, then there are probably there's the third bucket, which is um, areas around your operating model more strategically that say, do you know, we're never we we're never, never going to get to zero, but if we want to move to something to something that's even close to zero, then there's some fundamental change that you'd actually have to make in your business model. You can't just continue doing what you're doing. Um, I'm going to throw that one out there to to everyone, but in, in terms of that. Um, sort of moving towards net zero and both from a sort of a policy perspective through to a tax and a, and a downright, you know, this is this is the reality on the ground. It'd be good to, to get everyone's view on um, um, how manufacturers can help drive towards that sustainability agenda. Shall I jump in? Yeah, go on, go on, James. <laughs> um, I'll let you go first, mate. Yeah, in terms of the, the carbon emissions, we... Um, I think as with most other people, I'd assume we went for the low hanging fruit first. So our carbon emissions are down over 50% in four years since we started the project. But um, the scope three and the value chain stuff, that's a really, it's much harder to define and much harder to, to target and actually to get that buy-in across that value chain, both upstream and downstream with us as well. But we know the importance of it. We've, we've had some... Um, you know, unless we unless we're in line with it and aligned, we won't get invited to tender on certain projects as well. It's, there's a real commercial imperative as well as you're alluding to. Operationally, we also process materials for people, so we're very energy intensive. So we've got to look across a, across the whole piece of our business, as I say, both upstream, downstream, and internally as well. So, um, you know, ultimately, it is the biggest driver of the business. At the end of the day, it's not something you can kick down the road and think. We'll deal with it whenever you've got. Const you've got to be constantly making that change. Simon, Seamus, thoughts? Yeah, Richard, if I can come in there, I think that that's yep. a pretty pretty clear example uh, of the kind of thing that we hear across the board with manufacturing. It is a commercial imperative as much as anything else. Um, customers want to see this uh, as well as companies themselves. Um, but it's also, you know, whether it be automation, digitalization or the transition to net zero, whatever your priority is, I think a, a lot of people, when they when they look at this, can think, oh, well, it's, you know, it's going to be huge cost. It's going to be very disruptive. Uh, and it's really for the big boys who can who can do this. The smaller companies maybe aren't capable of, of, of doing this. And I think that that, that misses the, the point here. It's all about gradual improvement. Um, and that's why, you know, to go back to the, the point Simon made around around leasing, um, in full expensing, a lot of mid-tier companies use lease assets because it allows them to dip the toe into the water with new new technologies. That in in itself is is good for the environment because you're recycling things, so that you're you're creating a circular economy in that sense. But it also allows companies to learn that lesson and uh, and and to make the kind of insights and 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 gains from that that will allow them to continue that process. Going back to to, to James's example. You know, it's not something that will be done all in one go, but we are seeing a clear appetite across the board for lots of different reasons, one of which is that it's clearly in, in their commercial interests to tackle net zero and, that, and there's a clear ambition to do so. Um, and that process is starting now. Thanks, James. Yeah, and I think from my perspective, I'd, I'd agree with everything that Seamus and James said there in terms about improvement. Um, I suppose one point I have seen in terms of, again, it's probably more for some of the larger businesses, but it really plays into that that mindset of um, a commercial imperative about what they're doing emissions. It's driving some some level of uh, M&A activity as well in terms of looking at the types of sectors and uh, business areas that, that larger manufacturers are involved in, and some are leading to divestments as a result. So I think it's something that's just becoming ingrained within those business about how do we improve it, but also how do we, or what, what areas do we want to be involved in from a manufacturer? Um, one other thing that um, is kind of close to my heart, but um, James, you pick, you picked up on it a little bit earlier, is around that, that whole skills and availability of people who have the right skills um, and less, not necessarily at the right 
you know, at, at the lowest price, but actually having the right skill set to to support manufacturers. I mean, could you sort of um, sort of unpick that for us a little bit, James? I was, you, you're kind of saying that you know there's there have been open positions within your business that that haven't been touched. So are there um, are there sort of things that you're thinking about in terms of ways of filling those, and it'd be useful to also to get a view on whether you use apprenticeships, things like that, to uh, to support the business. We do have a lot of um, strong proponents of apprenticeships, and we know that that um, the grow your own policy is exactly what we're looking for as well. But given um, the demographics of our business, we, we're tending to um, we've got people who are slightly more experienced than is probably ideal. Let's say so we've got a bit of a gap in the middle of the the cohort that we have working at Oscar in the UK, you see. So we have apprentices in place, but it's that middle part here with people who may be um, five, 10 years into their careers as well that we're, we're slightly lacking here, that we didn't plug those gaps several years ago. So traditional routes as well, and certain areas we know that there's just the the uh, supply or the demand far outstrips the supply, and we're getting huge distortion in um, some of the the wage rates for some of these positions we're looking to fill and we do need to be creatively as well you know coming back full circle to government policy as well and, and whether it be um you know skilled worker visas and things like that as well that we need to have some guidance on that to know from where we can recruit people as well because um not filling those positions limits us commercially limits our potential as well to grow the business so it is a real um, challenge for us to do that. And we're having to look in slightly different places, the traditional routes where we've hired people from. We've been priced out of a few people we've looked at for a while as well. So we've got to be a bit more creative in how we're doing that. And apprenticeships is clearly one of the ones we, we do support. And we've got a great track record of developing apprentices, but you can't um, build in that five or 10 years of experience you know, immediately. You can't just flick a switch and get that with people so these people have built the experience of being in the job you see and that's one of the challenges we've got at the moment yeah yeah it's interesting um just thinking more broadly about the the world of education um obviously you know higher education is coming under the cost somewhat at the moment in terms mm -hmm. of the value of university degrees it does feel like there's a change in emphasis when you do talk to people who are kind of coming out of secondary school as to or um, uh, doing A levels, etc. Is do they do they really want to go through the university route, or is an apprenticeship um, really the better route for both you know for them both in the medium and the longer term as well? So it's it's an interesting. I think there's it seems to be a start to a change in that in in you know younger people's thinking that the apprenticeship route might well be a more attractive and probably more immediately remunerative routes to take um, uh, as, a, as, as a future um, career path. Um, Seamus, coming to you on that, I mean, in terms of the apprenticeships, um, from a Make UK perspective, obviously you've been big um, big supporters of, of driving that um, over the last few years. I mean, it'd be good to get your observations on that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, it just, just going back to James's point around the demographics of this, just to, to spell it out for, for the audience, um, the average age of a, a worker in the manufacturing sector in the UK at the moment is about 52. So about 20% of the sector are coming to retirement age within the next six years. So it's a really important aspect of, of ensuring uh, that sustainability and that growth uh, opportunity is there for, for the sector going forward. And that's why there's huge support for apprenticeships and the apprenticeship system. And there are fantastic opportunities uh, for apprentices, which I think is why, Richard, to, to, to go to the point you made, we are seeing um, an increased appetite amongst young people um, to engage with apprenticeships. Um, there is a, a significant challenge around provision. I spoke to one company only yesterday uh, that told me that they have about five applicants for every one apprentice they're able to take on because they don't have the college facilities uh, there's no training provider able to cater to their demand. Now, part of that is because of the way the levy system was set up. The costs of investing in the kinds of technologies that are needed to train people in manufacturing and engineering apprenticeships uh, is very expensive. And, and those costs have increased since the levy was introduced, whether it be energy, whether it be raw materials, whether it be other, other things. 
Um, but the funding pot that the, the colleges and, and uh, apprenticeship training providers receive to enable them to, to provide those training uh, uh, opportunities hasn't increased accordingly. So um, there is a kind of a mismatch in terms of the types of apprenticeships that are available and the number of people who are applying to do higher level, high, high skilled apprenticeships uh, that the manufacturing sector needs. So there is a huge support for the levy system. I think we are going to see uh, in the not too distant future some tweaking of that system to make sure that it continues to work in the way that was originally intended for the sector because it is vitally important and there is huge appetite amongst young people for apprenticeships, but also and particularly amongst manufacturers themselves. They want to see the system work because it's really, really important. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so it, it's it seems like you know there there are a few impediments to sort of uh, future growth. One is kind of the broader investment environment, um, uh, having that sort of um, industrial strategy that's really clear um, is critical for that. Um, in terms of the tax environment, it seems like things are heading in the right direction. I think that that least piece on um, equipment is a big lever. Um, because clearly kind of the scope around the tax benefits around CapEx has, has, has been sort of the, uh, the range and definition of it has been expanded over time. But I think bringing that least element into it is going to be quite a significant change to uh, people's planning and their, their planning horizon and the level of risk they're prepared to take around investment as well. So I think that's, that's really interesting as well. And then, I, yeah, that, that skills piece is going to be really fundamental. Um, it'll be interesting to see how... Um, how things pan out over the next 12 months, both uh, in terms of policy, but also politically as well. Um, from the uh, sort of conversations and uh, comments that I've been hearing so far, obviously we're in um, we're in election mode at the moment. Everyone's um, is being cautious, but is also not taking anything off the table. So it, it's difficult to find your way through to understand what does this really mean when the the rubber hits the proverbial road in terms of whoever's in charge next time. <laughs> Round. So that, that'll be really fascinating. Um, I just um, conscious of time, I think we've got five minutes left. Um, um, I have, Val, have we got any questions that have come through um, while we've been uh, sort of going through the session? Um, yeah, we've had a couple of questions um, which we can um, pose to the panel. Um, they are more focused around general, I guess, events around the world. So, um, so yeah, um, I can start with those. Yeah, thanks, Val. Brilliant. Um, so um, how do you see the tensions in the South and East China seas developing and the potential impact on manufacturing supply chain routes? Tumbleweed. I'll come in there. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a really interesting question. Obviously, these things are very hard to predict. Um, I think the implication for the manufacturing sector particularly concerns something like semiconductors. So 80% of the world's supply of basic semiconductors come from Taiwan. 60% of, of the most advanced semiconductors come from Taiwan. Um, and as we've seen in recent years, the shortage of semiconductors has been really disruptive across the board. They are an essential, almost like an oxygen for the sector, regardless of what it is companies make. They're used somewhere in the supply chain. Um, so that will be uh, something that I think we we will need to to keep an eye on um, and divesting and, and and ensuring that there are alternative sources should that uh, supply uh, be cut off or or disrupted at some point will be uh, really important. But we are seeing in the UK efforts uh, in that direction with the critical import strategy that was launched by the government in January. Um, there has been a recognition since COVID of just how volatile uh, and, and easily disrupted some vital inputs uh, can be. We've seen it also with the war in Ukraine. Um, uh, a vast amount of the world's uh, rare earth metals come from Russia and Ukraine and, and, and uh, companies were uh, had to scramble around and find alternative sources of those as a result um, uh, of, of that uh, war and that conflict. So I think embedding resilience has been a, a big theme of what we've talked about today. It's something that's borne out in the, in the survey results for this, this quarterly manufacturing outlook report. So it's something that companies are doing, but it's also something I think increasingly Western governments are looking at. It's going to take time um, for that to, to come to full fruition, but it's very much uh, front and center of, of a lot of uh, government planning around those three strategic risks, whether it be South China, whether it be the current situation in the Red Sea or indeed Ukraine or elsewhere. Yeah, thanks, James. It sounds like, um, you know, um, we, we've been through this quite a few times in terms of supply chain disruption. 
um, South China Sea or wherever else is is just as relevant as any other. Um, obviously, we had sort of blockages in canals previously as well, which have led to um, disruption in terms of timeline and also in terms of cost of supply chain as well and availability. Um, so I think it's going to be um, it'll be interesting to see how it develops. But I, it's one of those things that um, uh, you know everyone needs to be cognizant of and also have a kind of a plan B option if at all possible. Um, and and if if a significant impact uh, is expected from it for your particular uh, business, um, any um, any other comments on that one from the from the group? That's just to add to Emerson's point. Really, we we found that when um, semiconductors, the use is so ubiquitous. So you know, it really is a shock to all of your lead times and everything else. And you know. It, it, comes back to that point of resilience again. That there's only so much you can do when something's so fundamental, uh, when that supply network is pinched or supply chain is pinched or broken in some cases anyway. So um, it's looking at alternatives, but unfortunately in some cases you've got very few or very limited alternatives available. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, James. Thanks, James. Um, Val, any others? Yeah. Yeah, just one more question, and it, it pretty much links to, I guess, supply chain and shipping issue, issues. Um, do you think that a combination of the Yemen shipping issues and slow interest rate reductions will cause the sector to stagnate? Sounds like an economist question, that one. I could have a crack at that one, yeah. Um, well, in, in the second in the second uh, half of that question, I, I think it's probably, and I don't mean this as a dooming statement, but um independently high high central bank rates and high interest rates have all, sort of already caused the sector to stagnate as we said we've just posted forecasts for the year at, at 0.1 percent so um that, that that's pretty much there um i would say um interesting point on how slow they'll come down and now it really depends who you are some very serious name brand uh banks all come across with very different predictions on how fast or slow these interest rates are going to come down but i think they all are in unison that we're, we're at the top of the hill now, how, how steep the hill is on the other side is, is a question for, for somebody else, but it would be shocking if they were going to come uh, sort of retain or, or, or go up anymore. With regards to the Red Sea issues, now, it's something that I think um, we've played down uh, in our in our forecasts uh, based on the assumptions that the the, the quiet assumption that it, it will be transient. Um, it's not going to be an ongoing thing. That is our assumption. Um, but to this point as well, we've seen from other from other analysts that actually the manufacturing lead times have upped in in a short sudden time to their longest time, uh, their longest period uh, since July of 22, which of course um, was that that initial friction um, last uh, sorry two years ago. Um, we don't expect this to to continue, but we also think, and I hazarded against mentioning it in parts of the presentation, but it's possibly driving some of that price margin differential we're seeing because we've heard reports. Um, for alter alternative logistics selection, alternative supplier selection, uh, like we saw way back when uh, during that that COVID period, where UK manufacturers were choosing more expensive suppliers near closer to home as a means to bridge the gap, while their their typical suppliers were having um, lead time issues. Um, however, I do caveat by saying we don't currently expect this to be an ongoing um, issue under our assumption. Yeah, I, I remember talking to one business that. Um you know, during that kind of constraint around being able to ship stuff was actually flying chips from uh, from Asia to the UK. And it was like, you know, the, the economics made sense. So, uh, you know, there's a num number of things to think about that. Um, I'm just conscious of time. Um, I think we've kind of, we've, we've hit our, our 1.30 um, deadline. So thank you very much for all those questions. But um, just in closing, I'd really like to say thank you to... Uh, all of the participants and panel members um, on the uh, web webinar today. So thank you very much to you, Seamus. Uh, thank you, Simon, and thank you, James. And uh, and Mr. James Broom, thank you very much for your uh, your update in the beginning. As always, very helpful and uh, providing those sort of insights in terms of where businesses think they're going to get to and where they actually get to is always interesting to see what the divergence or convergence of that, that looks like. So um, thank you very much. I'd like to bring it to a close. Unless